The afternoon is going to be broken up into two and possibly three parts. Uh, the first is going to be relatively didactic talk about the sort of emergencies that you might come across um, if you cover sporting teams or may even present to your clinic. The title in your program is Orthopaedic Emergencies. As Michael's clearly said, I'm not an orthopaedic surgeon or, or orthopaedic registrar. So really going to translate that to the things you're going to see more commonly, uh, really, particularly with the AFL season just upon us, uh, football injuries, players coming into your clinic on a Monday morning, um, and uh, some of the things you might want to look out for. Um, the second part will be a hands-on, because I think most people usually get something out of just revising their anatomy, and it's going to be obviously surface anatomy today, so we're going to break up into pairs. I'll probably bring someone up here that I can examine on so that it can get recorded for the purposes of uh, the recording they're doing here, and then you'll each examine uh, your partner and just uh, revise some of the surface anatomy. And then I think uh, some of you were asked and may have some cases to discuss if you want at the end if we've got time. So. Hopefully we'll be done and dusted uh, just before three, before a colleague of mine, Hugh Seawood, will take over and talk about concussion. Um, just a story that I was involved in here outside uh, the famous Cadinia Park, 2007. I think a lady at the front here was also involved in the management of the player in question. It's a story that's fairly well known, uh, involves uh, Tom Lonergan. He was out on the wing over there playing Melbourne and he's a half-back defender, so the ball came down into the, uh, the half-forward area. He went up for the mark, but a Melbourne player came and hit him from behind with their knee and got him right in the loin area. So he was in a little bit of distress on the ground, was helped off, so he could walk off himself, but was clearly in uh, some distress. So rather than just keep him on the bench, we took him to the rooms underneath this uh, stand, and uh, my job was to, uh, to make some preliminary assessments as to what had gone on. The main feature with Tom was uh, how much pain he was in and relatively quickly also vomited, which, you know, you can vomit when you have a head injury and it could be a sign of something significant or it could just be just one of those things. But the vomiting was a concern and the level of pain was a concern. Um, so without further ado, we got a, a wide bore uh, gel coat into him and started putting some fluids in him whilst we'd already called the ambulance because we realised that this was no ordinary abdominal injury. The long and short was he'd ruptured his kidney and was bleeding from his kidney. Um, he had obviously kidney, the viscera, uh, can be well innovated and uh, the pain response, the vagal response, probably contributed to uh, his vomiting. Anyway, he did get transferred off to Geelong Hospital. As he was being transferred, his blood pressure did start to fall. Um, by the time he got to Geelong and he was stabilised, they decided just to, originally after scanning him, to just see whether it would settle and it would contain itself, the rupture, but he then decompensated at about uh, midnight spent six hours in theatre because they had some complications when they're in there of more bleeding that they couldn't control. Um, he had several units of blood, plasma, uh, and I think was touch and go for a while there. So the rest is history in that Tom came back and played another 150 or close to 200 games. Um, he didn't win a premiership that year, uh, but he won two subsequent premierships. So an amazing story. That's an on-field sporting emergency. And if you're interested in doing more following this presentation on, if you're involved in sporting teams, um, the College of Sports Physicians, Sport and Exercise Physicians runs a Management of Severe Trauma course, which is the Management of Severe Trauma on field. Um, so it covers a whole gamut of uh, presentations that we're going to touch on a little bit today. Um, so as I said, the College of Surgeons have always run one, but that's a little bit more specialised and more for emergency departments. But this, the college has uh, come up with one that's one run in Melbourne and then it's also at our annual conference, um, which is more specific sp sporting trauma. So we'll talk about some other sporting emergencies uh, now. Dislocated hip, that'll be uh, a separate uh, presentation uh, coming up, or a separate slide. Um, Obviously, dislocated hip, you've got to reduce that as quickly as possible because of the risk of potential avascular necrosis. And in a young footballer at 22, if his femoral head dies and he needs a femoral uh, or tip, total hip replacement, not a good outcome. So the risk of avascular necrosis is pretty much proportional to how long the hip spends dislocated. Um, perilunate dislocation, the lunate remember in the wrist, so we'll talk about the presentation of that and how it is relatively uh, important to first diagnose it and then reduce the uh, dislocation as soon as possible. We're not going to talk too much about unstable cervical spine fractures. They do occur in the sporting context. A colleague of mine was surfing only down the road at Torquay and got dumped by a wave off his board, had a bit of a sore neck. He was with a friend. They drove back to Melbourne. The, the friend was joking about his neck and saying, hey, look at up there, Kobe, see, see that cloud? And he was sort of getting him to move around. 
He was a bit sore the next day, so he went to uh, get assessed and had an x-ray and one of those ones where you're sitting in the waiting room at the radiology clinic and uh, the radiologist comes out and says, which one's uh, Mr. C? Um, could you just stay there? Um, we're just going to suggest you go to the emergency department. So he had an unstable cervical spine fracture that he'd walked around with for a couple of days, just from pure trauma, headbutting head the sand off a surfboard. Um, laryngeal trauma, I think it was Matt Johns, the Sydney Swans player. I think we've got three case histories from Sydney. I had nothing to do with Sydney, but they just happened to come up today. Um, Matt Johns was going up for a ruck and got whacked in the larynx and uh, had a laryngeal fracture. And you can imagine if you don't get in there quickly with an airway, that can have a disastrous outcome. So laryngeal trauma, rare but possible. Tension pneumothorax, colleagues of mine at Melbourne correctly, fortunately diagnosed a tension pneumothorax in a Melbourne player who came off feeling a bit short of breath. Uh, by the time I got him down to the room, he was feeling more short of breath and started going a bit blue and purple around the lips and they worked out fairly quickly that he was uh, having a rapidly evolving tension pneumothorax, put the gel co in his chest and had the very satisfying hiss as they took out the, uh, the in inside bit um, and uh, had a very good outcome. But uh, you can obviously, as you know, die and motor vehicle trauma, uh, vehicle accidents, that's one of the common cause of death in the vehicle is a tension pneumothorax that's not treated quickly. Dislocated knee, um, a rare injury, but we'll talk about that. That's where um, all ligaments, it's a total knee, they've literally dislocated their tibia off the femur, and uh, the concern there is the injury to any vascular structures and the implication of uh, potential loss of the lower limb if you don't recognise that quickly and get them assessed and uh, uh, treated appropriately. Fractured tibia and fibula. Uh, the reason I put that there is some of you may remember Jamie Lawson, whose career was ended at the age of 22, a Sydney Swans player. He had a fractured tibia and fibula at an MCG game once. It was appropriately managed and transferred to the Epworth Hospital, but overnight there was miscommunication in the observations for any potential compartment syndrome, and he lost his anterior compartment due to a uh, missed or delay in diagnosis of his compartment syndrome, and by the time it was recognised, uh, he had lost his anterior muscle compartment, so that's tibialis anterior, uh, and basically had a foot drop and could never play football again. So just a, a warning of fractured tib fib that we'll remind you of. Obviously, any fracture or dislocation, assessment of discal neurovascular function is really important. And if there is compromise, then you need to do something about it. And if you're on your own, you need to do something about it quickly. This rank fracture dislocations, we get a few of these every season, two or three in the AFL. Um, and they're in the foot, so we'll talk about that. Uh, this rank was a French cavalry room and got thrown off his horse and uh, got his foot stuck in the stirrup. So it's an injury where you're your midfoot gets stuck in the stirrup and you have a dislocation between the forefoot and midfoot. Um, the other ones we see it on sometimes are uh, uh, skateboarders and that sort of thing and also uh, um, windsurfers who get their foot stuck in the, uh, in the strap that their foot's put into. The last one, my colleague Hugh Seward is going to spend the last hour of the afternoon with you managing head injuries and concussion, which is obviously, as you know, very topical um, over the last few years in the AFL and all the sporting codes are taking it uh, they always took it seriously, but it's really much more uh, expertly managed with the information that's been coming out over the years. So there are the sort of just a bit of an overview of some true sporting emergencies, things there that really need um, intervention pretty quickly. A lot of sports injuries you can manage without um, getting uh, urgent sort of interventional treatment. You can manage them with just a simple rest, ice, compression, elevation, reassurance of the patient that this is the injury, it's going to be fine. You may use appropriate splints, cam walkers, etc. So we'll talk about some of that. So the neck, um, they're rare, but uh, remember uh, in the sporting field, we can get C cervical trauma. The sport that's most associated with it, the sports are rugby league and rugby union. If you watch those sports, the way they position themselves sometimes uh, is that they can get a compression injury on their, uh, on their head uh, during the tackle, uh, scrummaging um, where the two players, two packs pack down. Sometimes the scrummage collapses and that can have a very forced compression flexion injury to the cervical spine. So they are situations and there have been instances where um, players at the elite level and also rec uh, recreational level have suffered significant injuries. So as I said, they are rare. Neurological signs obviously may or may not be present, so don't rely on that. They obviously usually have neck pain, so part of the head injury protocol, if someone's had um, a, a concussion episode and they're not fully awake, is assume that they've got a cervical spine injury, which is why you see the immobilisation of the neck and the protection of the neck when you watch on the television um, the players being transported off um, from the sporting field. So they've always got uh, pretty much a neck brace on.
So support and stabilise the neck until the ambulance arrive. Your job is just to protect the neck and make sure you're not going to cause any further injury um, with unnecessary um, uh, movement of the neck. So cervical spine fractures, rare, but remember they do exist. Remember the patient who walks in on a Monday after an injury on the Saturday who may have a significant cervical spine uh, injury uh, with only neck pain, no neurological signs, so at least uh, get a plain x-ray. So the clavicle collarbone will start on the inside, the sternoclavicular joint, um, an orthopedic emergency is really a posterior dislocation of that. Um, the reason is listed here. You can see that, uh, so here's the clavicle, this is the top of the, uh, the sternum, and here's a posterior dislocation. The reason it's pr a problem is because of what sits behind there. So you've got compromise potentially of the subclavian vein, but obviously the trachea, so airway compromise, great vessel compromise can occur from uh, sternoclavicular, so we'll all palpate each other's sternoclavicular joint. It's the posterior dislocation that's the problem. We do see anterior dislocations, anterior subluxations, but we don't worry about them as much because obviously they're going away from the trouble spots. Um, so as I said, uh, it's usually, the again, the contact forces is someone's head butted against their uh, uh, medial clavicle that can push it back. So it's more the rugby um, codes, but we can see it in football as well. And if it is significantly dislocated and they may be showing signs of some dyspnea or some stridor or problems, then we talk about getting the old surgical towel clip and literally just clamping uh, the medial end of the clavicle and trying to reduce it by pulling it forward. So that can be a life-saving procedure. I don't expect anybody in this room to see one, but if you do, you heard it here to do something about it. But um, So we do see stuff, um, sternoclavicular, and as I said, that's the reason why. Um, the clavicle itself, you do see fractures, and the biggest problem with a clavicular fracture can be if there's a severe angulation. Again, we've got the subclavian. The reason it's called subclavian is because it goes underneath the, uh, the clavicle, so subclavian artery and vein. So very occasionally you can get parts of the fracture potentially um, sticking into those, uh, those vessels if they're very displaced. Certainly surgeons who operate on uh, clavicle fractures are very aware of the neurovascular bundle, particularly if it's a, a non-union or a delayed union of a clavicle that they've decided then isn't going to heal and with conservative management and operative management may be uh, undertaken, they have to be very careful because by the time you've gone in there six, eight weeks later or even 10 weeks later, if it's uh, been given plenty of time to heal and it's not healing, there's an awful lot of callus and scar that can wrap itself or get close to those vessels. So, um, uh, and I do some surgical assisting, so I've been there at surgery where we've had to be very careful and I've heard of cases where they have made holes in the subclavian vein or artery and needed to call the vascular boys in very quickly to, uh, to help out. Um, so clavicle fractures predominantly managed conservatively, but significant displacement, if it's tenting under the skin, then there are um, cases for doing operative intervention, usually with plates, but there are some surgeons in Melbourne who advocate putting um, pins and screws across the fracture, um, similar sort of screws to used in scaphoid fractures in the wrist. But by and large, most clavicular fractures can be obviously managed conservatively. If there's significant overlap of the two fracture fragments, you try, if you can, and get them to brace and open up the shoulders. So there are specific uh, clavicular fracture braces where they try and pull the shoulders back to get the, the uh, fractures, two fracture points, uh, as far apart as possible to stop that overlap. And the reason sometimes uh, athletes can get operated on uh, if they're a throwing athlete or if they're a swimmer, for example, having a shortened clavicle can predispose to shoulder problems subsequently. So there's a case, an argument for a sort of elite swimmer, elite thrower, tennis player of getting there and operating to get the clavicle back out to length. But for most athletes, it's, it's not a major issue. At AFL level, um, obviously clavicular fractures non-treated, uh, non-surgically treated can take uh, at least 10 weeks before you allow them back to contact sports to get the fracture to be strong enough. Um, at AFL, AFL level, the reason is they get operated, they can get back at three weeks. Um, so you stabilize the fracture and you can get them back. In fact, the Western Bulldogs player, De Jong, um, in 2016, wasn't it, when the dogs won the flag, he got back and played in the VFL Grand Final, um, I think about two and a half weeks post-op, and he played, so he played very quickly. He was down at the club 48 hours after his surgery, wanting to take part in full training. He, had, he was just that motivated, and it's a, a powerful example of how, with motivation, you can get going very quickly. And you compare that with a work cover patient who might have a fractured clavicle, 
who won't get out of their sling for four months, um, you can see the dichotomy. But I'm, I'm not joking, it's just that motivation and what the brain can do. And in fact, you can partly put down the doggies' uh, premiership to the doctor was very motivating to the players to reassure them that they had some significant injuries leading into the finals, but he managed them by sort of saying, it's going to be okay, we've got this covered, and uh, did some other clever little things that got players that normally wouldn't play back on the park. Now, you could argue, are they going to have more, inj or more problems because they played too early? Um, not really, in most cases. And the clever thing with De Jong, as you probably know, is they strapped his opposite shoulder during that final, which tricked the opposition into thinking they should target that t other shoulder when they... Mr. Missed, missed an opportunity to break his, uh, break his clavicle again. So yes, the little tricks of the trade, you know, you've just got to be switched on to these things. So I'm going to go to the AC joint. Um, again, a common sports injury, uh, certainly not an emergency. Um, there are six types. We m mostly know uh, the types one, two, and three, so I'll uh, go to this slide. So just reminding the anatomy, we've got the clavicle joining up with the acromion, acromioclavicular joint. Um, this is really here, the, uh, this is the AC joint, there are capsular um, ligaments that support the joint there, but then there's also, you may remember, the conoid and trapezoid ligaments, the coracoclavicular ligaments that come from this thing, the coracoid process coming from the front of the, the uh, scapula. So, and then this is the coracoacromial ligament for, under which the rotator cuff tendons go. So type 1 is purely just a sprain strain of the capsule. Um, they're locally tender. Um, they generally can get going pretty quickly in terms of active movement. Um, there's no evidence of subluxation either on x-ray or palpation. There may be soft tissue swelling, but there's no evidence that the uh, distal clavicle has um, been subluxed superiorly. Type 2 is where the coracoclavicular ligaments are still intact, but they've usually um, ruptured and disrupted the capsular ligaments, so there may be just some slight distraction, but there's going to be more pain and uh, more tenderness over the AC joint, and they may have, may have a slower recovery in terms of active movement. Type 3 is where you see subluxation or dislocation of the, the distal clavicle because the conoid and trapezoid ligaments have been ruptured in association with the capsular ligaments, but the majority of these can be managed conservatively. Ideally, you try and put a little bit of pressure on the elbow superiorly to try and reduce the subluxation, if you can, in various slings. Um, or you can use taping. Uh, the local physios can help you out with trying to, sorry, trying to uh, reduce the dislocation. But uh, there was a Richmond footballer who had a completely unstable, you could grab his distal clavicle and wave it around, but he'll still bench pressing 200 kgs and had no loss of function, was playing AFL. So there's no correlation between how unstable it is and function afterwards. Um, but again, at AFL level, they're often operated on because if you treat these conservatively, it's an eight to 10 week recovery. If you treat them operatively, it's often a two to three week recovery, getting them back on the field of play. So it's uh, what you see at AFL level and management of injuries does not necessarily and apply immediately to, uh, to players at the recreational level. So as I said, your majority of AC joint injuries are types one to three. And as I said, even types three where the x-ray may show spectacularly that it is dislocated superiorly and you can palpably um, hopefully feel that. They do very well with conservative management. Type 4, 5 and 6 are very rare. Um, the type uh, 6, I'd love to see how the clavicle managed to get itself underneath the uh, tendons coming off the uh, uh, coracoid process, um, the bicipital tendons coming down there. Um, another one is where it gets sort of stuck in the platysma, the small superficial muscle, so it gets dislocated posteriorly and gets, uh, gets caught between the platysma um, so it, it, and trapezius, so it can't get back. So it's stuck out there and you need to surgically get it um, uh, out of there and, and reduced. So basically four, five and six all require operative intervention, but they're incredibly, they would probably account for less than one or two percent of all AC joint injuries. So as far as you're concerned, types one, two and three, they're hard to differentiate sometimes. That's pretty straightforward, um, the type, uh, type three, but can be managed conservatively. Moving on to the shoulder, the most common dislocated uh, di uh, position that the shoulder dislocates is coming out the front. Um, but we're now recognising more superior, uh, sorry, more posterior dislocations and also more posterior sort of subluxations in the non-acute situation. The anterior, often easier to reduce as soon as possible. We'll go through some of the techniques that you might want to use to reduce them. There are dozens of them described in the literature, so it's really what you're most familiar with, what's worked for you in the past. 
Um, for me, it's the lying the patient prone on an examination table with the arm dangling down. You can often put a light weight in their arm to provide some gentle traction. You may need to give them some muscle relaxant uh, intramuscularly and um, some, obviously some analgesia, and then just gentle traction with the arm hanging over the edge of the bed. The patient lying prone can often be a, a good way. If you get them really acutely, you can just simply just try and gently abduct the arm if you see them pitch side and sometimes they just go in with a satisfying clunk if you can just get them to sufficiently relax and get them, uh, get them back in. But once they've been out for a long time, um, you know, obviously the muscles start to tighten up, it's harder, and even in the uh, in emergency department with um, medications as well, it can be hard to, uh, to put them back. Um, posterior, as I said, is much rarer. The problem with the posterior dislocation, the shoulder doesn't look dislocated when you look at it, particularly in the more muscular individuals. Um, if it's an anterior dislocation, the shoulder will be squared off because the um, humerus has come forward and uh, sitting uh, more medial, therefore you get this sort of squaring off of the shoulder. But the posterior ones, they don't actually go very medial when they go um, behind the, uh, the glenoid, so it can be difficult. The main thing is they can't externally rotate. So if you find someone who has had some shoulder trauma, and uh, classically in the textbooks we were always taught that it was epileptics um, who get posterior shoulder dislocations, the shoulder can get pulled pulled out during an epileptic fit. Um, but if you can't externally rotate, then just think maybe this could be a, a posterior dislocation. The biggest problem with posterior is that the x-rays can look remarkably normal and they are missed even by radiologists unless they're given a clue, could this be a posterior dislocation? Because the uh, alignment of the, the glenoid and the humeral head can look pretty normal on the x-ray. The anterior dislocations, remember the axillary nerve can get uh, traumatized, uh, neuropraxy of the axillary nerve. So remember the regimental badge sign, so-called the sensory distribution of the terminal branches. The axillary nerve is over the regimental badge area on the lateral deltoid there. So check for sensation and check the deltoid function. So obviously axillary nerve abducts the arm. So if they can't abduct, then consider that they might have an axillary nerve um, neuropraxia. That can generally be watched, but uh, there are sort of um, sometimes indications for trying to find out whether the axillary nerve has been caught up in, in some uh, scar tissue or some of the injury. Um, the role of nerve conduction studies and orthopedic assessment as to whether you go and explore the axillary nerve is something that you can, uh, you can think about. But by and large, it's just a, a recovery time for most of them to come back, but can obviously take six to 12 months. Now the value of immobilization, previously it was thought that if you put them in a sling and immobilize them for at least three or four weeks, the post-anterior shoulder dislocations, that it would reduce their risk of redislocation. Studies have shown that that's not the case. So you don't have to keep them immobilized in a sling for too long. It's all about pain relief. And once they're getting comfortable, it's better to get them going quickly to stop the muscle wasting. And you can do some simple exercises down in fairly neutral and then progress them up into more functional areas. The reality is that if you dislocate your dominant shoulder as uh, in your teen, late teens or early 20s and you continue to play a contact sport, there's a very high chance you'll probably come out again. Most people would say, give it one shot, let them um, play on after uh, an anterior dislocation um, and at AFL level they'll continue them playing for the season and then usually stabilise them at the end of the season. So a lot of players that have, at AFL, uh, most AFL clubs will have one or two players with unstable shoulders playing throughout the year. You'll see them often come off if they've had a bit of a subluxation, they're taped up, they'll go sit on the bench for a while and they'll go out again. And it's not to be trivialised, there are problems with recurrent subluxation, dislocation of shoulders, it can prem, um, bring on premature osteoarthritis. So. It's a bit of a, a case of making sure that, uh, yeah, they're not hopefully doing untold damages to the frequency. And if they're clearly getting two or three episodes a game, you sometimes have to say, this isn't working, we'll have to pull the pin. Clubs who miss out on finals three or four weeks before the end of the season often send their shoulder, unstable shoulders off for surgery before the end of the season. So sling's more for comfort. It doesn't need to be put in there for too long. Um, and in fact, in the older population, the, run, the risky run of immobilization too long is to get a frozen shoulder. So once you get past 30, 35, your greatest complication from a dislocated shoulder is actually a frozen shoulder, not an unstable shoulder. So get them going, get them down to the physio, give them some simple exercises to, um, to get the shoulder strong. Moving down, dislocated elbows, relatively rare. Um, we talk about the triangle, and we'll talk about, so that's the triangle that you look for to determine whether this elbow may be dislocated is between the medial and lateral epicondyles and the olecranon. That's almost an equilateral triangle. We'll palpate everybody's in a minute. Um, so if that's not congruent and you've, you've missed, you're not, you haven't got the triangle, then you're starting to think this elbow may be dislocated. 
It's pretty hard to reduce a dislocated elbow yourself pitch side. Um, you usually need some sort of sedation and a couple of strong people to distract it and uh, put it back in place. Again, don't forget the neurovascular bundle uh, sitting in the cubital fossa, the median nerve particularly, so check for any neurovascular compromise um, post-reduction, pre-reduction and post-reduction. And always obviously get an x-ray, and in most of these cases, post-reduction, get an x-ray looking for any small fractures that may be trivial but just worth noting, or significant fractures and possible loose bodies as a result of those uh, um, fractures, which may require removal surgically um, down the track. Often an association, you know, if you're going to dislocate a joint, you're going to often have some associated ligament injury. Um, maybe the medial stabilizers on the elbow, particularly if they've had a, a valgus force that's dislocated it, so they might have completely ruptured their uh, medial elbow ligament complex, uh, rarer on the lateral side. Um, surgery may be required to repair those, but often if you brace them, uh, but it will need a hinge brace, um, quite a sophisticated brace, to, uh, to rehabilitate those. And most of them, like the medial collateral in the, in the knee, scar up pretty well. And again, if they're not a throwing athlete, something like that, tennis, then they can generally get away and they may be a little lax down the track, but it's not going to affect them functionally. But certainly at the elite level, um, medial ligament uh, instability is a concern if they've had a significant uh, tear. So elbow, that's the dislocation to be aware of. The wrist, the one I mentioned here, is the one that does get missed most often. Um, it's just one to be aware of. The perilunate dislocation, hopefully this comes out in the x-ray. So there's the lunate, the moon, sitting there. It's sitting in its normal place, and the wrist dislocates dorsally from the, uh, the lunate. So the lunate stays where it's supposed to be, uh, and the rest of the wrist. So that's why it's called a peri, a surrounding lunate dislocation, as opposed to you can have a lunate dislocation where the lunate pops out the back and the wrist stays where it is. But this is more common. So um, if someone's got a big swollen wrist within an hour or two, it's going to be hard to pick it up. So it's mainly obviously a radiological diagnosis. They have a clinical suspicion. You need a good lateral to see it. The concern about it is um, because of the compromise of the median nerve. So they're going to probably present with some uh, sensory disturbance in the distribution of the median nerve, carpal tunnel symptoms, um, and they may have some uh, motor weakness as well. If you leave that dislocated for too long, that median nerve doesn't like it. You're looking at CRPS, complex regional pain potential syndromes, um, and obviously long-term dysfunction of the median nerve, which will significantly adverse uh, affect that function. Um, they're not going to be able to reduce these yourselves in, in your surgeries or even often in the emergency department, so they usually have to be done in theatre. Open it up, do a carpal tunnel release because of all the soft tissue swelling anyway is going to probably adversely affect the, uh, the median nerve post-operatively as well, and they often have to be stabilised with K-wires because of the, you can imagine, the ligamentous disruption. There are lots of ligaments holding all the carpal bones together, so to do that you've got significant ligaments as compromise, so they're often K-wired um, uh, K at surgery to help stabilise the, uh, the wrist. So not a good injury, needs to be recognised early. Obviously, it's not just the sporting field, they can be just simple falls on the ground. We've got a question. Falling, just falling, unfortunately, yeah, just to fall on the old outstretched hand. Um, so you'll see it in workers, you know, um, so think about it, and some of the workers may be big, Strapping guys, big wrists, then the swelling on top. It's just a clinical suspicion you have. Get an x-ray, good lateral, uh, and just check for, uh, for that, uh, that sort of uh, scenario. But it's all about having that index of suspicion. Um, so that's the major sort of wrist uh, concern. Fingers, uh, in footballers, they just say it's just a finger. Uh, and then you have a look at retired footballers and they put their hands up and they look like this and, and you go, is it still just a finger? So um, yes, they were trivialised and poorly managed, mainly because the footballers didn't really care about them, but uh, we're trying to be as aggressive as possible at AFL level and other sports. So um, yeah, various injuries, uh, dislocations, you'll see them pop out on the football field and the doctor and the physio sometimes uh, putting them back <laughs> almost as they run off, but uh, usually uh, hopefully with a bit of privacy. Um, sometimes quite hard. The PIP joint dislocation is uh, the most common one. Um, one of the reasons why it won't go back sometimes is there may be a fracture there and that may be compromising your ability. So, you know, you only pull and push for a certain period of time before you get them off and get an x-ray. Um, they'll often compromise the collateral ligaments and or the volar plate. The volar plate is the thing that stops us being able to hyperextend at the PIP. 
So they need to be uh, x-rayed to check for fractures that may need surgical intervention, and obviously simple things like asking to make a fist, and if, if there is a significant rotational deformity, as you know, we all sort of, the fingers all come into the scaphoid tubercle here, they all sort of point in the same direction, but if you've got significant rotation, then that finger may go way off and, and sort of go over the top of the other finger. So a little simple test like that, just to see whether there may be uh, a fracture here that needs operative intervention, um, because I said, if they're manual workers, that may not be the best outcome for them. So otherwise, you can splint them. If it's a volar plate injury being involved, as it usually is with a dislocation, you usually splint them at about 20 degrees of flexion. You want that, scholar, that volar plate to scar up and stop them becoming unstable in extension. So you're prepared to get some stiffness in extension to allow the, uh, the appropriate healing of the, the volar plate. So um, spent them in about 20 degrees. The collaterals, they have to, as I said, be kept an eye on because if you have a, the collaterals on either side stabilizing it, if you have a uni uh, collateral injury, then you can get a finger that drifts off and starts um, not being obviously uh, wearing the joint equally and you can get rapid arthritis developing in the PIP joint if a collateral ligament isn't splinted appropriately. So as I said, they are taken more seriously now. You only have to look at those retired footballers see what their fingers look like. Um, yes, most of them cope pretty well, but some of them may not be able to play golf or something like that because they can't grip the club with the, uh, with the finger deformity. And even with expert management, they can still be a nuisance. And you probably may have seen some uh, patients who've had appropriate surgery, appropriate hand therapy, and they're still slow and, uh, and challenging. Some of the dislocations can be compound. So obviously just be careful of infection, irrigate the joint significantly, antibiotics and regular follow-up for any possible infection. Um, so that's the upper limb. We'll go down to the uh, hip. We talked about it briefly. It is a true orthopedic emergency. It's rare. Um, it's sort of a dashboard injury and a significant uh, x-ray CT here shows where someone's left part of their, uh, their femoral head sitting in the acetabulum with the, uh, the femur out the back. There's the x-ray, you, you can see the x-ray portion of the femoral head sitting there with the, uh, the rest of the, the femoral head sitting behind. It's often associated with um, acetabular fractures and sometimes that's the only clue. Uh, sometimes people have subluxation episodes um, of their hip and the clue is that they've got an acetabular fracture when they've maybe fallen or stumbled. A colleague of mine presented a number of cases where people just stumbled out running on a curb and had presented with hip pain and had had a subluxation episode of their, uh, of their hip. So um, it is, uh, as I said, associated with usually fairly significant trauma. Um, I can't think of an AFL player who's had it. I was working at a clinic, uh, sports medicine clinic one weekend and one came in the back of a van, which we sent straight off to hospital to say, we're not even gonna touch him, he's got a dislocated hip. Um, and as I said, the reason is that the risk of avascular necrosis subsequently is linked to the time the joint is uh, dislocated. Uh, there was a rugby union player um, that a colleague of mine was involved in as well, and fortunately he um, recovered well and didn't have it. His hip was out for a couple of hours by the time, from the time of injury to getting reduced in the, uh, the operating. So just be aware of them. Um, again, rare on the sporting field, but needs to be picked up quickly and intervened quickly. The knee. I talked about dislocations of the knee. The concern there is that you've got potential for significant neurovascular compromise of the, uh, the tibial artery and the veins at the back there. So that's a dislocated knee is where multiple ligaments, so usually both collaterals and both ACL and PCL. So it's a true dislocation of the knee, unlike the subluxation injuries that we see with ACL tears and sometimes PCL tears. This is where you've had a true distraction injury, rare, fortunately, but if you do see it, um, I was involved in one and the guy had a significant common perineal nerve injury as well, so you need to uh, recognise that um, uh, with a foot drop and uh, sensory change, um, and he got significant problems because of the perineal um, in nerve injury that came as a result of his dislocated uh, knee. So just beware of that neurovascular compromise if someone's had a, a major episode uh, of trauma to their knee and you start to maybe examining and everything seems incredibly loose and you think, what is holding this knee together? Then just be wary and they need to be kept an eye on. Um, the story out here, the Sydney Swans player I told her we had another story, was uh, Darren Creswell a few years ago, dislocated his patella on the ground out here and you saw him on the cameras banging his own kneecap back in. He saw it out and he just thought, I'd whack it and I think he managed to get it uh, back in before um, the trainers arrived. So dislocated patellas are obviously the, the most common dislocation in the, uh, in the knee. 
and they can be reduced by just slowly extending the knee by putting pressure on the lateral aspects of the patella and obviously getting appropriate um, relaxation from the, uh, the patient. But uh, they'll ha often have their knee flexed, the patella will be sitting out, hopefully a fairly straightforward diagnosis, and then just gently extend them while you're putting firm pressure. Maybe they'll need the, uh, the green whistle to, uh, to help them along. Um, again, as with all the ones that we've talked about with uh, dislocations, get an x-ray, check for any fractures. It's often the medial patella fracture that fractures either when it goes out, but more commonly when it comes in, it can chip a bit of um, sometimes just cartilage off, so you won't see that on an x-ray, but sometimes it's an osteochondral fragment, so you'll see a little bit of bone associated with um, just through that medial aspect of the patella. Um, you can often leave them. Sometimes they do become loose within the knee and they will need surgical excision. Um, but you can, as I said, just sometimes keep an eye on them for a week or two and see whether they are truly loose or whether they get scarred up with that medial patella region. So you put them in the Zimmer splint, but you do try and get them going quickly as well. Um, these are usually younger um, patients sort of in their teens and sometimes female. Um, they may be athletes who have an element of generalised ligamentous laxity so multi-directional instability, so they might have kneecaps that are very easily dislocated, but they also may, the patient then may be quite frightened about their kneecap and not wanting to move the knee. So if you put them in a splint, try and encourage early mobilisation because otherwise they lose their quads very quickly and they then start to uh, have problems associated with that and not wanting to bend the knee. So generally we immobilise them in a splint in extension, but with early emphasis on quadriceps exercises and saying that it's safe, you're not going to dislocate your kneecap in a splint, we can do some straight leg raises, and you're not going to dislocate your kneecap starting some gentle flexion-based exercises very quickly. So again, it's that mental side of just reassuring them that it's safe for them to get this knee moving. Use little um, metaphors like motion is lotion. We've got to keep this, uh, got to keep this uh, thing moving. Ankle, um, saw one in casualty. Uh, when I was a resident at the Alfred, fairly rare, but here's ones where the tibia has uh, lost its contact with the talus. This is associated with a distal um, fibular fracture as well, so there's the fibular fracture, but the, you can see the tibia is out. Sometimes said there's often no fractures, they've just sort of uh, popped it out, and as I said, if you can, try and reduce it as early as possible to uh, reduce any risk of neurovascular compromise, and then obviously, as we saw there, um, take an x-ray to see if there are any associated fractures after reduction that may need um, treatment. Um, but again, with the advent of the cam boot, we can immobilise these without having necessarily put them in plaster. Um, you can, with the cam boot, there's going to be lots of swelling, but as the swelling goes down, you can tighten up the cam boot around it. Um, you can put them in the cam boot and have them non-weight bearing, um, and then you can start partially weight bearing and get them going fairly quickly if they haven't got any major associated uh, bony injuries. So ankle dislocations. Further down the foot, um, the Lisfranc injury is one that can be missed. It's a twisting sort of injury. We talked about uh, windsurfers. Uh, we talked about people falling off horses. And then occasionally in AFL, we've seen a few. Matthew Richardson had one. He actually, at uh, Eddie Had or Marvel Stadium, as it's called now, um, came down awkwardly from a mark and hobbled off. So he actually came off uh, semi-weight-bearing. Um, what a Lisfranc injury, and this is a very extreme version, where you get an injury between a very important ligament that holds the first metatarsal, the base of the first and the second metatarsal. Here it's called Lisfranc ligament that gets damaged. And most commonly, it can cause a bit of a shift of the four metatarsals from the second to the fifth laterally. In this case, it's all five of them have shifted because you can see this is no longer articulating with the medial caniform and the poor fifth metatarsal has, is just basically articulating in thin air. So the whole thing has been shifted across. But most commonly you'll see on x-rays an increased gap between the base of the first and the second. You need often a comparative view with the uninjured side to be able to appreciate that. And you're going to palpate through that area if that's where the, the swelling and the pain is and say, I'm concerned about a Lisfranc injury, get an x-ray. Um, there are studies looking at weight-bearing CTs to see whether that gives you an idea of how unstable the, uh, the injury is, as well as um, uh, a more proximal injury in the ankle. So the reason I mention this is because early operative intervention is critical for the significant Lisfranc injuries. The minor ones, the grade one, two strains of that ligament, which is often hard to diagnose clinically, and that's where you sometimes need scans, CT or MRI, to determine the extent of any injury there. Um, can be managed conservatively, but there is a need for operative intervention as well, and the earlier the better for these, uh, these patients with, uh, with a Lisfranc injury. So um, just remember, an injury 
and pain that's associated around the base of the first metatarsal, swelling and pain down there, not an ankle one, it's more down in this sort of midfoot to uh, forefoot articulation, um, and as I said, a very important one. I didn't put in the ankle one, that uh, an injury that we talk about, obviously lateral ligament ankle sprains are, are extremely common, but the high ankle injury, which is the syndesmosis. So that's between the distal tibia and distal uh, fibula. Um, they'll have tenderness over that joint and we'll try and make sure everybody is happy to palpate um, their syndesmoses. Um, again, a few of them need operative intervention, but it's important to recognise that injury because they need to be immobilised with or without potentially operative intervention. Weight-bearing CTs can help with that as well. So if they haven't got much swelling around the lateral ligament and lateral malleolus and it's more just a little bit more proximal, and it's often a, an injury where they've got caught in a tackle and rotated, the foot stayed still and they've rotated externally, and you've got the tibia pushing out against the fibula and tearing that inferior tibiofibula joint or syndesmosis. So that's the high ankle sprain. So that was a Cook's tour. Um, hopefully just sparking a bit of revision of anatomy, the different injuries that you might come across. Um, we've got about half an hour now to do some examinations of each other, which I hope uh, you'll get something out because you're probably thinking now, where were all these structures? So we'll just, as I said, it's easier to do them in pairs probably. Um, so if I can have one volunteer to come up and join me, and then if you can just break into pairs, I'm gonna get you to do some work, I'm afraid. And we're just going to go through just simple palpation of some of these bony landmarks to make sure that you're happy with them. If you want to fire some cases at me, we can. Thank you. Um, so, yes, just where you're sitting. You might not know the person next to you, so this is a chance to get to know them a little bit more than you might do in conversation. <laughs> Yes, you better introduce yourselves. Uh, and if I can just ask Tim while you're introducing yourselves. I, I just wonder, you know, with all these things that come to you out of shape, are there times where you, you just want to get out and do it, which obviously if there's neurovascular stuff happening, you might want to get... Are you someone who tends to just get on and do it, or do you tend to want, wait for x-rays and things? I think get on and do it in most cases. Um, I mean, it depends on obviously the ease of access of x-rays, but... Uh, you know, if you're having trouble reducing something, it may be because there is a fracture. And if the, you know, if the patient's in a lot of pain and screaming and you're on your own and you're worried about giving them too much analgesia that may bomb them out and then you've got an airway problem and you're trying to reduce, then clearly. But it's, you know, it's what you're comfortable with, um, recognising the pattern of injuries and what are you likely to be dealing with. Hopefully something simple like a dislocated patella, you're confident with. Shoulders, just lie them down, relax them, calm them down, put a gentle weight in, and we can just slowly try and see if we can get that shoulder back for them. Um, but yeah, I think uh, mostly get in there sooner rather than later, and then the x-ray afterwards. But if you're struggling to put something back, then stop, say, maybe there's a reason. Let's get an x-ray, and then it may become obvious why you're not able to reduce that joint. Yeah, Medaz, yeah, I think that would be fair enough. But again, you've got to have the staff there because if you're going to, if someone does start <laughs> going too fast to sleep, you need to make sure you've got the resuscitation equipment appropriate and airway management and that sort of thing. So if you're on your own, I probably wouldn't use Medaz. But if you've got two of you there, one can manage the airway, look after the Medaz, um, and then you know you can you can get them going. But it's generally if you can talk them and relax them on their stomach, it's actually quite relaxing to have that arm just gently into traction, put a little bit of weight or manual traction on it, and often you'll get the satisfying clunk back and you can feel the bony landmarks. All right, so the first thing I want you to do actually is you'll have to um, get them with your back. So the first patient is standing with your back to you because I want you to, the easiest way to do sternoclavicular joints is actually just to feel from behind, feel their sternal notch and then come and feel the sternoclavicular joints. So you get the notch. All right, and then you're going to do just lateral to the notch, and you should be, if you then hit the clavicle and then go back a bit, the sternoclavicular, and I'll undo. So you can usually see people's sternoclavicular joints, but what you're going to feel is, again, fortunately, we've got given two sternoclavicular joints. You hope that your patients have only injured one. So you've got an ability to say, what is the normal one feel like? What is the abnormal one feel like? Most commonly, you'll see anterior injuries. So they'll be tender and swollen. 
and you'll feel, you'll feel that uh, medial clavicle being a little bit more forward, anterior, all right? But if you've got someone who's feeling a bit compromised in their airway and it's, there's a big hole there, then you're concerned about a posterior dislocation. And as I said, get your towel clip out, knock them out with something, or give them a, the green whistle and pull it forward. So sternoclavicular, we should all be happy with that. Now you can palpate, please palpate everybody's clavicles. Again, often done either anterior or posterior, but if you've got them still with the back to you, then do just palpate along the clavicle until you get to the little bump at the end, and that's where we're heading for with the AC joint. All right, so just get a feel. Remember the clavicle is S-shaped. The commonest place for it to fracture is the proximal two-thirds and distal one-third. That's its weak spot. So that's, if you're going to feel for a clavicular fracture and you've got tenderness there, then it's going to be the proximal two-thirds and distal one-third. All right. And beware the AC joint injury that you think is an AC joint but can be a distal clavicle fracture. So if the fracture or if the tenderness is more over the distal clavicle rather than on the joint, just think, I wonder whether I'm dealing with a distal clavicle fracture. So again, x-rays can be very important. I hope most radiology clinics these days do not ask patients to hold a weight as they did, as some of the group here are old enough to remember. They used to get them to hold a weight to try and accentuate any subluxation. So just put on your request form, no weight holding, please. You just want to have, you don't want to, because the patients will say it really hurt to hold that weight. So we don't need any weights held. It doesn't change your management to know how much it's subluxed or dislocated, all right? So the AC joint, again, you've got to, people have got two AC joints. One we hope has never been injured, so you've got to, some people have really bony AC joints, that's just them. So don't confuse a subluxation with a normal bony AC joint. So palpate the AC joint, see how, uh, as I said, tender it is and then do your active movements, and you may feel a step. You may feel a step, but if you can gently put some pressure on their, under their elbow and push up, you'll often see any instability just settle down. So it, it can reduce easily. There's no soft tissue in the way, and it's likely to be okay to manage conservatively. So that's the AC joint. Just to remember, just in, so come down from the AC joint, and you'll feel, hopefully, the coracoid process. So just remind yourself where the coracoid process is. That's bony thing sitting just below the AC joint. And you can feel it as a little round thing sitting just below the, uh, the AC joint. All right, that's the attachment of the conjoint tendon. But as I said, occasionally an AC joint injury will be um, sitting in that region. So that's just to give you an outline of the, uh, the bony anatomy. All right, let's go and feel the acromion and drop off onto the rotator cuff and your humeral head. So I want you to sort of go from the AC joint a bit further across and let's all feel the back corner of the acromion, which is sitting at the back there. So we can feel the acromion and the back corner. If you do some of your subacromial injections from this posterior approach, that's your landmark that you use. And then you can follow the, cr the lateral acromial border forward and then you drop off onto the rotator cuff. So you're gonna have, you can just feel that acromion from that back corner and then come across. You can have acromial fracture. So if someone's got tenderness on the acromion, uh, you're thinking maybe this is a, a rare, but you can see acromial fractures. So that's the acromion. And then we drop off onto the uh, rotator cuff, which then allows you to grab the shoulder from the front and back. So get used to feeling the humeral head at the front and the humeral head at the back. And you can sometimes just have a little play forward and back just to get a feel for the, uh, the humeral head, all right? So said, we said the anterior dislocation is classically shown by a squared off shoulder. The humeral head comes to sit at the front and more medial, so you'll see when you've undressed them that the shoulder will look squared off. It won't have the nice round appearance. So if you see that squared off shoulder and they can't elevate, you're thinking shoulder dislocation, all right? The posterior are difficult, but you try and feel whether that humeral head's sitting out the back. Um, but that's, as I said, the, uh, the rarer foam. When I talked about blocked external rotation, yep. I'm injecting into the bursa, which is a big structure. So this, is, this room is the bursa. You can come in from the front, you can come in from the side, or you come in from the back. You're still going to inject 
the subacromial space and subacromial bursa. For me, it's a, such an easy soft spot at the back here that you come in just underneath that posterolateral acromion and you're injecting the bursa. So for him, I routinely do that because I know it's going to get, I might inject the stuff here, but it's going to get spread through the whole bursa by them using their arm over the next. Rarely. Nope. I'm confident. Even though 50124 got taken away, it's coming back soon. So welcome back, 50124. <laughs> Some of you will know what I mean by that. Um, I'll also just get you to feel the scapula. So you can come from that acromion and then feel along the spine of the scapula. All right. So from the acromion, that posterior lateral, you can come across and then you can feel the bony ridge, which on the top is going to be the supraspinatus, and the muscle underneath is infraspinatus. So feel that spine of the scapula, and then you can come to the medial board of the scapula and work your way down to the inferior angle, which are Michael's down there. So just get a feel for palpating scapula. Scapular fractures are rare, but if you get hit from behind with a knee in that area, if you've ever seen from your uh, anatomy days the, uh, the, the skeletons that we used to have, the scapula in the infrascapular area here, infraspinatus area, is paper thin. So it's quite easy to fracture it. And if you were uh, rugby league fans watching the storm against the Roosters last year in the grand final, the old Melbourne Storm player Cooper Cronk, who was playing for the Roosters, had a fractured scapula and got up for the uh, grand final, despite the fact, if you saw him, he could barely move his arm. There was a lot of controversy whether he should have played, but the doctors got lots of opinions, and the overall opinion was he couldn't make the injury any worse, and uh, he played with a, a fractured scapula. So think if they've got some localised swelling, going footballers, country footballers, that they've got some localised swelling in the inferior scapular region here, think a scapular fracture. The concern is whether it involves the joint, and therefore often you will need to get a CT scan to see if it involves the glenoid, the joint of the shoulder, and whether there's any displacement, because that may need operative intervention. But most scapular fractures can be hit, managed conservatively without any problems. So hopefully you've got a feel for your, your scapula there. All right, do you mind just looking at me? Um, so the triangle I talked about, hopefully you all know your medial lateral epicondyles. So when you just bend the arm up, you've got the two epicondyles there, and there's the olecranon, and they're in a basically almost an equilateral triangle. All right. So you're looking for that if you're concerned about has this person dislocated their elbow, there's clearly going to be loss of that triangle. So medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle at the end of the humerus, and then the olecranon here, they're in a nice triangle. All right. Don't forget the radius. Uh, the head of the radius, you can get dislocations, the classic pulled arm, elbow, and the child not crossing the road properly. Come here quickly before you get run over, and they can't come in and they move, can't move their elbows. So just remember, you can get little pulled elbows of the humeral, uh, sorry, the radial head popping out, and that can be just gently manipulated back into place, um, and then get them going fairly quickly. So just in front of the, how to palpate that is just in front of the lateral epicondyle, as you rotate, you can feel the rotation of the humeral, uh, sorry, the radial head and that's the radio humeral joint, all right? So that's the elbow. Just to give you some anatomical landmarks, um, obviously the two bones in the forearm, there's the distal radial joint, you can sometimes get injuries and dislocations of that, so that's gonna be on the ulnar aspect, you've got the radius here, and here's the distal radial joint, so you can feel for any pain or problems associated with that. And remember your scaphoid, the anatomical snuff box, so remember putting the thumb back, depending on how much snuff your ancestors uh, snorted on in the Victorian times will depend on how big a snuff box you've got. So if you feel the snuff box, you can do it on yourself or your partner. Down on the proximal end is going to be the distal radius, so that's going to be sore if they've got any sort of Collies type fracture. The first bone you're then going to come across is the scaphoid. So you're worried about scaphoid fractures if you feel in the snuff box, so that's a test for a scaphoid fracture. Then you're going to get the trapezium, which is at the base of thumb, so um, thumb, so if you remember that trapezium, and then you've got the first metacarpal. Football injuries, at the base of the first metacarpal is called a Bennett's fracture, and often is intra-articular, often needs surgical intervention, so just remember if they're sore at the base of the first metacarpal, think Bennett's, think x-ray, does this need operative intervention or not? Is it intra-articular, and does that need a little uh, screw or wire put in? So that's just surface anatomy there. Um, lunate, so if you, again, slightly palmar flex the wrist, 
as you come across the distal uh, radius on the back there, you can feel Lister's tubercle. I'm sure all you remember that from your anatomy days, this is tubercle. <laughs> so it's a little bony bump that you can feel just at the end. The reason you like this tubercle is because if you lift the thumb up, you can see that there's a tendon that winds around. It's the EPL that goes around there. It's one of the ones that can get ruptured in rheumatoids. But the Lister's tubercle, the reason I give you Lister's tubercle is that just in front of that, going towards the fingers, is where the lunate sits. All right? So that's where you can try and get your palpation around the lunate and just think, is the lunate there? And can I feel everything else come back away from that in the perilunate. So remember, perilunate, the lunate stays where it is. The wrist itself, the rest of the carpal bones come dorsally. So if you can't feel the lunate because there's a hole there, then think perilunate, all right? So, and next door to the lunate and scaphoid, between them is the scapholunate ligament, another classic fall on the outstretched hand, it can be misdiagnosed, particularly if they had a lot of force behind it, that sometimes needs a mobilization and or operative intervention. If you miss the scaphoid ligament and they can come back five or ten years later, it's called a slack wrist, S-L-A-C, which is scaphoid advanced collapse. The um, capitate bone can sink between the scaphoid and the lunate and you get rapidly evolving osteoarthritis in the wrist and they often can be only salvaged with a wrist fusion. So that's why scaphoid injury. So that's going to be in that area between the scaphoid and the lunate. So if you've got soreness there, think about scaphoid injuries. MRI usually for them, yeah. You can see, remember the British actor called Terry Thomas? The Terry Thomas sign. He was that actor, he had a gap between his front teeth. He was on all the Carry On movies, if you remember seeing those. So you get a Terry, you ask for, if you're suspicious of a scaphoid you ask for a clenched fist view. So you ask the radiologists and you just put query scaphoid they should do it for you, but you are, the patient is asked to clench their fist. If they've got a complete rupture of the scaphoid ligament, the scaphoid and the lunate will move apart and it's called a Terry Thomas sign, you see this gap between the scaphoid and the lunate. Surely you've all heard of the Terry Thomas sign. It's my English heritage that's uh, brought that out, but it's called the Terry Thomas sign. So you can see it in all the radiology books. All right, going down to the fingers. So as I said, um, it's usually the PIP joint that you're going to be um, seeing dislocations of, and you try and you can pull them, traction, pull them towards you this way, with pressure over the middle phalanx, trying to pop them back in. So pull and pop them back in. That's how to get them in mostly. Rather than trying to go this way and pushing them that way, I often find traction and pushing them back in. And most of them will go back in quite satisfactorily. Then you check for collateral. So just hold on to the finger. Let it slightly drop into flexion and relax. And then you're just going to hold the proximal phalanx here and you're going to hold the tip and just wiggle it from side to side and get a feel for the tension and firmness of the end point of the collateral ligaments. The most famous collateral ligament injury is the skier's thumb or gamekeeper's thumb, which is the um, collateral ligament injury, the ulnar collateral ligament. So skiers getting their stock caught and the thumb gets pushed that way and they rupture it. And some of you may know a thing called Stenner's lesion, where part of the um, one of the muscles in there gets caught between the two torn ends of the ligament and therefore they'll end up with an unstable thumb and that needs operative intervention. So that can be seen on ultrasound. You sometimes get your local radiologist to have a look and see is there a Stenner's lesion? Is the ligament going to be compromised its recovery? But otherwise you can splint them, but sometimes they need. And as I said, uh, the gamekeepers, it was their the stock of their barrel that used to get caught as they were doing their hunting, fishing and gathering of the ducks. So collateral ligament injuries, you feel, and then fold a plate, you just hyperextend and get a feel for whether again, that most people have got nice firm endpoints, but the loose jointed people are a little bit lax, but in people have ruptured it as part of the dislocation, you'll just keep on going and you might end up with the finger going almost to 90 and you go, I think I'll stop there, I think you've done your bowl of play. Um, so you just put them into about 20 degrees of flexion with a dorsal splint on top to stop them from extending, let it all scar up. Yes, they'll end up with a slightly stiff finger, you can get them to bend, but you don't, like, you don't let them fully extend for about four to six weeks and then get them going after that. So that's how they heal the bowl of play. Uh, you Splint the finger in flexion and then often buddy splint it as well just for the first couple of weeks just to keep it out of harm's way. But yeah, buddy splinting is a fantastic thing to do just to protect the injured finger. So thank you for ruining that. All right, that's up, up. What should we do for the, uh, the lower limb? Um, yeah, let's just have a look. Michael's going to take his clothes off now. <laughs> I would suggest sit down for the lower limb because I want you just to obviously just have a feel on yourself 
lovely legs. We should have someone who's got shorts on. The hip dislocation, as I said, that's, you know, if you've got a patient who's had clearly trauma where they may have fallen on their knee, remember it's a dashboard injury, typically hip dislocations. So mimic that on a football field, and if someone's behind them and adding some weight, then that's how the hip pops out. So they hit the ground, enough force, if they're being sat on by 120 kilograms as they land, then that can add to the force, not just their weight. So if they're coming in with buttock pain, groin pain, just have it, and you can't move their, you know, they're just not moving their leg uh, into flexion or any rotation, think dislocation, get them off to the emergency department and hopefully there'll be an orthopedic surgeon on call to pop it back. So we won't do too much up in the hip there. So the knee, just have a feeling yourself, the patella, um, just, you'll have to just put your leg out a little bit and relax the quads because then you can get a feel for just moving the patella medially and laterally. Some of you may have quite mobile patellae, some may have quite tight. You can all, obviously the more mobile the patella, if they've got generalised ligamentous laxity, so that's your gymnasts and that sort of thing, then they're going to be possibly more easy to come out. But also, um, at the bottom of the femur is the femoral trochlea. Trochlea means slide. It's where the kneecap slides up and down. So if you get a skyline view of their knee, which is the classic view to have a look at the patella and how it sits in that trochlea, you might see that they've got quite a shallow trochlea. So that will predispose. So if you haven't got a very deep trochlea, you're going to have much more chance that your kneecap may come out. And it's classically a rotation injury. They sort of grab and turn, and the kneecap pops out laterally. The only time it comes medially is when someone's done an operation to tighten them up, and they've tightened them up too much, and they can sometimes come out medially. But 99.9% .9 of dislocated kneecaps are laterally. So as I said, it's that sort of grab, netball sort of thing, and they can do that, and it pops out. So just get a feel for that. So if they come into you and they've got the knee in that flex position with the patella sitting there, just gently try and extend them as you put pressure on the patella and it will just pop back in, all right? And then you just leave them in that extended position, put the simmer splint on, get an x-ray. You won't be able to generally get a skyline view straight away. They might not want to flex up, um, but you can get a, an AP and a lateral and that will start to give you some information. Have they got a bony little injury to the medial patella facet, all right? So, uh, so that's your patella. Um, Simmer, well, for pain relief, but I get them going and out at about the two-week mark, but only partially. You know, if they're at school, they might be in the sprint at school, but at home, they can start doing some gentle flexion exercises just in the plane of the, uh, the knee, so they're not twisting it at all. Um, hopefully get on a bike within three weeks or something like that. Just gently, you say, it's safe. You're not going to pop your kneecap out with just simple straight-line activities, all right? So you want to minimise their quadriceps wasting. Even in the Zimmer sprint, you can ask them to do some active-assisted elevation. All right, so, or just lift their knee up and hold it. All right, so you want to make sure they don't lose their quads too much. Um, the other things to palpate are laterally, you should all be able to find your perineal nerve. So, this is the rare instance of a dislocated um, knee where you get uh, some nerve damage. So, you find the fibular head. So, in your bent knee, you can find the fibular head obviously just through the lateral aspect, but just below the fibular head, you should be able to. Palpate, and I think I'm just getting my probably just in that region there. So just below the fibular head is where the perineal nerve is, and if you've had a significant traumatic knee dislocation, that can be compromised. So remember, perineal nerve is uh, tib ant function as well as perineal function. So lifting the foot up, so they might present with a foot drop, or they may present with sensory disturbance over the dorsum of the foot. Think perineal nerve damage. Um, proximal fibular fractures. They occur, so remember feel just from the lateral aspects of the knee down and feeling for any bony tenderness through there. Um, it's too hard here just to do any Lockman's testing for ACL, but the easy way to look for potentially a PCL injury is if they've gained fallen on the front of the knee, but it's the tibia. This used to be the Ruckman's injury until the rule change where the Ruckman used to go up and they used to clash knees, and that could put a posterior, dis a posterior force on the tibia, and that's how they could rupture their PCL. So if you just have the patient lying on the couch, and bend, have them at 90 degrees and then just compare the two knees at 90 degrees and just see whether there's a what we call a posterior sag of the injured knee. You see it sitting backwards because the PCL isn't holding it in place. And then you can grab it and you pull it forward and it comes forward more than you'd expect but has a nice firm end point. So it's not an ACL tear when you do your anterior draw test. It's a knee that's starting backwards. You bring it back to neutral and then you clunk it because the ACL is solid. So that's how you can think about a PCL but think of mechanism. 
obviously as well. If they've fallen on a on hard surface and bang their knee and you're thinking PCL, in that bent position you can do an unfortunate cruel thing in the acute situation, just bang the proximal tibia and if that hurts, you're stressing the PCL, it may be just a grade one, two, but it gives you a clue. Um, going down to the, uh, the bottom, we're going to get the ankle, obviously you can feel both on yourselves and anybody else, the medial and lateral malleoli and uh, just the relationship of the talus to that. And I talked about the high ankle sprain. So just in front of the lateral malleolus, so come up just about a centimetre or two from the tip of the lateral malleolus and feel just medial to that, and that is where the syndesmosis is. So that's where you're going to have most pain and tenderness for people who've got a high ankle sprain, and that's usually a rotational injury. Foot planted and they rotate, they're tackled, so they get grabbed, their foot can't move and they rotate and they strain their syndesmosis. So they've not got a lot of pain and swelling over the typical lateral ligament. They may not be having as much swelling, <coughs> but it's over the syndesmosis, so they need to be put in a boot and protected, and sometimes checked for whether they've got a significant tear that might need operative intervention. And then lastly, the list frame. I'm going to have to carry you up as well. This, we've been practicing this all day. <laughs> if he falls that way, he's in trouble. So, come up in the... The, web, the first web space and just feel up between the first metatarsal and the second metatarsal all the way up in that intermetatarsal space and when you start to hit bone that's where that this frank injury is because that's the base of the first and the second and it's a ligament a very powerful ligament that stabilizes the base of the first locks them in and if you have an injury and tenderness over there suspicious of a list frank injury and get an x-ray as I said you won't see one like the one I showed you where all five metatarsals are shunted across but you might see some degree of the second to fifth moving across so get them doing a weight bearing x-ray if they can hopefully weight bear and get them to give you both feet and then you can compare the gap between the first and second on the uninjured side with the injured side if you see a suspicion that it's widened you're thinking less frank maybe get someone to check that out as to whether it needs operative intervention you examine as gently as possible, but you try and work out if you can where the maximal area of swelling and tenderness is and correlate that with the underlying anatomy below it. But it is hard. If they're really swollen, if they, it's an hour or two later, then you can just sit on them. You can put them non-weight bearing, put them in a boot if you've got one, bring them back a couple of days later, get them to elevate, eyes compress, trying to reduce the swelling as quickly as possible and then reassess them, get an x-ray, such a simple thing to get, checking for those sort of things. I do the lying down, so... <laughs> <laughs> Is this going beyond the corner? So left shoulder dislocated, get them lying down, put his left shoulder down like that. And you're on an examining cut to help, so they're a little bit higher. And then, you, as I said, they're going to be about another... 57 meters higher. So you just you can just originally get them into that position. I mean that's quite it can be quite hard to get them there. And then you can either just apply traction yourself or get them to hold a weight just to five kilogram weight, something like a couple of kilograms, just get them to relax. And then as they're holding that, you're going to pull and that will cause the remember we talked about it's come out the front, it's come a bit medially, just pulling down allows it enough distraction to then pop back into place. So that's probably the most popular one. You know, there's the Hippocratic one where you're sitting in the operating theatre, you've got your foot in the axilla and the ones that you see. You can go on YouTube and look at 10 favourite ways of reducing your shoulders. So, if you want to, so that's what you can get these days, obviously, on, uh, on the internet. Ways of, uh, different ways, so it's whatever's more comfortable. But if they come into you with that, lie them on the table, get them to relax. And they'll often feel, just with the arm hanging down sometimes, that it pops back. So that's the easiest way. But if it doesn't go back, it can be because there's a fragment sitting in the joint. Stop. Get them off to hospital, get an x-ray. Okay, that's why we're having difficulty. This might need an open reduction rather than a closed reduction. And sometimes it's traction for quite a while, isn't yeah. it? How long are you sometimes? Uh, look, if they're comfortable, you know, there's no risk like the hip of ABN or anything like that. So just keep them comfortable, 10 or 15 minutes. Just let them really relax and then just try. As I said, you may start giving some medication. Might give them oral medication. Might give a bit of uh, diazepam or something like that orally, and that will take a while just to get into the system, just to get them relaxed. You might use the green whistle for some analgesia. Um, so it's depending on what the yeah, circumstances are. All right. Well done. Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Tim, for a most comprehensive review of all these important things. <laughs>